Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm um, sure that you have come uh, probably under false pretenses, um, at least insofar as you're hoping to hear me, um, in that, as Melchior said, um, I am the oldest member of the court and I am the least senior um, since I was only sworn in in October uh, and since I have a grey beard, um, even a white beard, it's evident that anything I say ought to be viewed with scepticism. Um, I say that lightly, but I should say seriously that my role here is to offer some high-level general thoughts about the general problem, because that's been my assignment from uh, Professor Petit and from Melchior. Uh, in addition, this is a talk by someone who used to be a practitioner, who used to be a professor, and has thoughts about the law. If you came here expecting that you would get guidance as to what the general court will say, uh, next month or next year on any particular question, please ask for your money back. Um, my role is to talk for a few minutes about big picture general principles uh, so that in a sense to set the vocabulary for the meeting that's going to come. Um, first of all, we are surrounded by standards. Uh, this clicker, this microphone um, will be governed by dozens and possibly hundreds of standards which govern its physical characteristics, its pluggability and the characteristics of the electronic and electrical impulses which will make it work. So we are absolutely surrounded by products which uh, are covered by standards. Now, in Shapiro's famous article, um, he describes how standards have been with us for a very long time. And in the United States, after the great fire of Baltimore in 1904, it was a massive embarrassment when neighboring cities discovered the incompatibility of their fire firefighting equipment. And so there are many, many situations you can even find in Roman law um, standards uh, prescribed uh, by the public authorities for the building of roads. So far from being a vehicle for anti-competitive uh, cartel behavior, standards can promote safety, quality, and all kinds of good things. At the same time, it is true, they have often been used, um, occasionally been used, sometimes been used as a mechanism to pursue guild-like um, anti-competitive ideas. So, we should begin any discussion of standards with, shall we say, an open mind. Now, standards can be set for a number of reasons, and I'll mention two. One is uh, quality, and the other is compatibility, and those are the two big families. Um, quality is a standard which is defined in order to set an ideal, and if it's fortunate, if it's lucky, then that quality standard will prevail. You most often see that in connection with food, with drink, with organoleptic pleasures. So Luxembourg whiskey is a concept, but Scotch whiskey conveys something more reassuring, more encouraging. And so there's nothing to stop someone selling Luxembourg whiskey in competition with Scotch whiskey, and there's nothing to stop someone selling odious liquor and calling it plain whiskey in Scotland, but it will do better if it satisfies the quality standards established for Scotch whiskey. Um, and 
You know, I'm sure, there have been lots of fun litigations about beer, about feta cheese, about Parma ham, whether it can be sliced in the supermarket or must be sliced by an artisan in Parma. All those questions are part of the richness of the European experience. And a, a country that has 400 brands or kinds of cheese may be ungovernable, but it's certainly a great deal tastier. Now, each of those cheeses probably is governed by a standard. So there is no, um, there is no obstacle to making tasty bluish cheese in Cornwall in the south of England. Uh, and it might be very similar to the cheese that's better known as Stilton, uh, but it can't be sold as Stilton because the definition of the quality standard is one that also includes a geographic place name. Okay, so how do we adopt standards? And obviously I'm going to be talking mainly about compatibility standards and obviously uh, lawyers will have discovered that it's in high-tech communications equipment that there is constantly uh, controversy. So, the, uh, the normally standardization can emerge from the commercial success of one particular technology. Those of you who are not as old as I am, but um, not babes in arms either, will remember the battles between PAL and SECAM. So PAL and SECAM were two alternative video standards and one prevailed over the other. Uh, a few years ago, um, the Apple regime and Windows were bitter rivals. Now they're trying to cohabit. So. Uh, it isn't necessary that there be a final decision, and it is quite common sometimes, quite common, for rival standards to battle it out for public favour. Now, um, the most celebrated recent quarrels, disputes, some of which I have been involved in, and Melchior Watley was Advocate General, um, in uh, some of these disputes, most of these disputes, have, re have related to the formal standardization process. So let's imagine um, what happened uh, in a case about whether a mobile phone uh, could connect uh, to the internet, uh, to um, a signal, very rapidly during times of crisis. It is necessary for the police and the fire to have, or desirable, for them to have privileged access during public emergencies. And there are various ways, there were various ways, there are various ways of achieving that outcome. Uh, the goal being to ensure that a police radio or a police telephone gets quicker service than that of an ordinary consumer at moments of emergency. So the industry sits around a table, and it is um, there we have an intriguing set of people with different objectives. So in the group of individuals at the table discussing what should be the standard, there are probably no lawyers, there's probably many engineers, and the engineers work for companies who have different interests in the discussion. So some of them, some of the companies present, may be researchers building new technology which they want to sell. More of them will be exploiters ex of uh, manufacturers, exploiting the technology, using the technology, and licensing each other back and forth with maybe hundreds of, of uh, licenses going back and forth between them. And then some may be pure manufacturers on license, and some may be downstream. So round the table, discussing what to do is a range of entities with different views over what technology should be adopted. Now, because of the way things are, most of those technologies that are proposed probably will be covered by a patent. Now, is the patentee 
who hopes that his technology or his company's technology, her company's technology will be adopted, is the patentee revealing to the other people present that we have patents. More delicately, has he revealed, will she reveal, that patents have been applied for but not yet obtained? So the discussion goes on about what's the best technical way to ensure that police signals get rapid service during moments of emergency. One of the company's technologies is apparently superior. And someone says, is that patented? Now, depending on what the answer is, the others may say, hmm, well, OK, we don't mind taking that technology, although mine's better. But if you insist on taking that technology, I want guarantees that you can't hold us up. Oh, yes, sure. We're a reasonable enterprise. We will be cheerful about granting reasonable terms. We're very easy to do business. OK, fine. And so the technology is adopted. Now, what I'm saying sounds rather folkloric, but it is very common for immense disputes to, uh, to arise out of circumstances where, at the moment of agreeing what the technology would be, the parties were not clear as to what would happen if the party whose technology was picked chose, had already obtained patent protection, and expected to get a lot of money. Now, if the patentee whose standard is selected is a manufacturer, it might have a different view to a request for a license on FRAND terms. It might have a different view depending on, for example, who was requesting the license. It might have a different view if it was merely a research and development company, or it might have a very different view if it merely, if the enterprise merely had a package of patents out of which it wanted to make the most money. Now, the word troll is often used in the United States and a bit in Europe, and it's kind of an insult uh, to denote the entity which wants to make um, substantial sums of money or money out of licensing a patent with no regard for the inconvenience that's caused. So there have been numerous, numerous battles over such claims. There have be also been battles uh, in a, a case called uh, Rambus about the promise or not by the, um, by the licensor, by the holder of the technology, whose technology was picked as to what it would do in future. So uh, caricaturing it round the table, there's 20 enterprises, 15, 10 enterprises, discussing what's the best way to speed up the performance of the DRAM. And two inventors have got a really nifty way of speeding up the performance of the DRAM. It goes on the clock cycle in the middle and at the end. Now, um, that sounds simple. It is complex. And the technology uh, supposedly works. Will it work? Who knows? Anyway, there's a discussion. And some people say, is this going to be patented? And the would-be, um, the, the inventors say, and then what they said has been the subject of litig was the subject of litigation that lasted about 15 years. One side said, yeah, of course we're going to make money out of this. What do you think we're in the business for? And the other side says they heard, hmm, we're not sure. But the technology having been um, accepted, there was an opportunity for the patentee 
who now holds the standard essential patent to make a great deal of money from it. Now, moving forward to the case in which Melchior was involved as Advocate General. The, have, we, have we got clear the notion? There is the standard. Um, there is the necessity to agree on a technical standard in order to achieve compatibility. And that standard has been, after debate, picked. It may not be the best technology. It might be, but it may not be. But it's been decided that's the one that's going to use, to be used. Probably questions of cost and ease of manufacture come into it. Possibly the nature of the um, technology holder and its reliability come into it. Anyway, the standard has been picked. And therefore, the lucky holder of the technology who has patented that, uh, that technique uh, may be in a position to make a lot of money. So someone comes on to the market and requests a license. The person who comes to the market says, I'll pay you three cents. And uh, the holder of the technology says, you'll pay me 3%. 3% is ridiculous. You can't possibly ask for that. It's, it's a nice to have thing for the police to talk to the mass quickly at times of emergency, but that's ridiculous. No, that's my price. Now, how shall competition law address that debate? In IMS, we saw the alleged hijacking of a standard, um, a, a map, and the European court produced an interesting judgment um, on what should be the standards in considering a refusal to license. Of course, at the time of the adoption of a technical standard, uh, there is usually a promise to license on reasonable terms. Now, what are those terms? When I was a baby lawyer, and until really very recently, the European Commission and other agencies were really reluctant to get into the business of price setting. They would say, you get on with it. We're not really expert. We're not good at finding out what is the right price to charge for this technology, for any technology. Um, and then we came to a situation where, as part of the uh, portfolio of remedies available to a patentee, was the right to seek interim measures. That's to say, an order to the manufacturer using that technology to stop doing so. That's to say, hundreds of thousands of devices, phones or computers or tires or parts of a motor car could not be sold and commerce would be paralyzed. That sounds terrible. No, no, it's not so terrible. It's just the patentee legitimately exercising its right to go to court and get a remedy. It has a problem. Someone is admitting that it's exploiting its technology, but it's not paying for it. So um, the question then was, are there obligations imposed procedural obligations imposed by the competition rules constraining the right of uh, patentees to close down a business by seeking injunctions. Putting it differently, are there minimum obligations on licensees um, who or would be licensees as to what they should offer and how they should behave? Putting it another way, is obstinate, unreasonable, rude, aggressive, bloody-minded assertion of an intellectual property right, it's aesthetically objectionable, but is it, should it be uh, reachable by the competition rules? And there were two broad choices, and now I'm being very, very high level and very general. 
the orange book analysis of the German courts seemed to say that going to court and exerting all your rights wasn't necessarily an infringement of the competition rules, even if it could cause stupendous inconvenience. And now we go to the um, most recent case, uh, at least I think it's the most recent case, which is the Huawei one. And in that case, we can see maybe, I'm not sure, but I think it's perhaps a European first, where the Advocate General proposed a certain parameter, a certain framework for approaching the negotiations, and the European Court took a slightly different framework, but got into the notion of the extent of the obligations of the parties. And um, uh, they produced definitions uh, of the procedural steps which the parties should follow. So, um, my role here is not to offer answers. Um, I'll just offer uh, some non-answers and some recommendations. The first thing is to note that standards are an area where people are fiendishly, brutally uh, liable to get into disagreements. Um, in the uh, 19th century, there was the great battle between Edison and Westinghouse over whether AC or DC was better current. And among other ways of showing that the other side was wrong, there were experiments done in electrocuting animals with AC or DC current. And uh, it was suggested even that for the electric chair and the execution of convicts, uh, one kind of uh, current was more dangerous than the other. So there is a well-established phenomenon which courts have to recognize, which is that when standards are being discussed, people get violently agitated. Second thing to say is that it's common for the standards to be discussed by technicians between technicians with insufficient precision as to what shall be the consequence of the adoption of a standard that's covered by one of the people present uh, by, by a standard which is covered by a patent. And um, uh, the third thing to say is that standardization is not at all immune from the competition rules um, and separate proposition immense numbers of difficulties and controversies could have been avoided uh, if the process by which the standardization debates were conducted had been done under better supervision with just such elementary things as minutes, good chairmanship, and clarity as to what was going on properly recorded. So the priority, I would say, uh, for policy is to keep going with the, um, with the line prescribed by the court very recently in its Frand case and to encourage those responsible to adopt transparent and reasonable rules and actually to observe them. So those are my non-remarks which I hope will generate more useful debate by technicians of the law who can speculate more robustly than I can. Thank you. Thank you.